so thanks everyone for coming this morning. Uh, anybody have any questions before we get started? Anything? Nothing? Comments? I don't know. Something? Do you want to say something besides me? All right. So we'll get started. Security. So we talked about three things. Somebody. Tell me what they are and why they're important. I mean, besides what, like, confidentiality is not an answer because it's on the board, right? What does that mean? What does confidentiality mean and why is it important? Only the intended people should be able to read or, you know, access certain information. Only internal people? No, in, uh, intended. Intended, intended people, yeah. yeah. Only authorized intended <coughs> people? Yeah. What about integrity? It's like un unauthorized. Yeah. No unauthorized person can modify or change the information. Yeah, so no unauthorized person can change or modify or add information to something. Right, yeah, that could be one. Uh, what about availability? So availability, these are all very high level concepts, but they are, are important to the security of a system. So I think I maybe ended class this way, but I'll do it again. So anybody here write perfect code? I think I should put my hand up. Perfect, bug free, works the first time you compile and run it code. Why not? Are you all terrible people? Everyone in this room would be bad programmers. It would be a shame. We're all human. We're all human. Yeah, right? And what do humans do? <laughs> we make mistakes, right? We make errors. It's part of, it's a fundamental human. part of being human. Uh, I mean, if we could fix it, at least with software, that would be cool. But probably in general, yeah, I don't know. It'd be kind of boring if nobody ever made any mistake ever. So yeah, so software is developed by humans. Humans aren't perfect, therefore the software is not perfect, right? And um, so this <coughs> shows up in software, right? When we're developing software, um, because a human error can introduce a bug or a fault, right? So what do I mean by like bug or fault? What does that mean? Those are kind of generic terms. What do you think of as a bug or a fault? No okay, let's go here. Unintended performance of the program. In what kind of sense? Performance like fast? It's not fast enough. Like what it was supposed to, like the task it was supposed to perform. Yeah. So some kind of so like an unexpected task that it did perform that it wasn't supposed to. Yeah. Or that was unexpected. Or that was unexpected. Yeah. Something that was unexpected. Yeah. What else? No ah, you've been developing software for years, right? What are some of the mistakes you made? Let me be honest. <laughs> it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. It doesn't do what it's supposed to do. And it, or it does what it's not supposed to do. Or it does what it's not supposed to do. Yeah. It fails at a particular like, test case or something. Yeah, it fails on specific data. So it could work for, I don't know, 90, 95% of tests of the data input, but that 5% causes a crash, right? That would be definitely a bug or a fault. What else? Not secured. What was that? Like not secured. 
Not secure in what sense? Like, and if there is a login page, if you're trapping the credentials and you're getting login, but if you're trapping any other credentials, then also it's going to the home page. And yeah. it's not secured. Like, it's working fine, but it's. Yeah, so that's, I guess that's kind of a little bit of the unintended behavior, right? Like, it shouldn't behave that way, but it is, right? But it's still functioning correctly. Yeah, go ahead. Adverse side effects? Adverse side effects, like what? Memory leakage or uh, on, um, like, uh, affecting the operating system in a bad way. Yeah, so maybe your program's leaking memory, right? But it's still running correctly, it's running correctly for workloads. Uh, but after a day's usage, it balloons up to two gigabytes, and then three days it's four gigabytes of memory, and then all of a sudden gets shut down. Uh, funny story I like to think about that is the I think the initial 1.0 version of Ruby on Rails. Um, so, anybody know the company and, and or the guy who created Ruby on Rails? Yes. Good. I should have looked this up beforehand because now you're all waiting for me to know the answer. Uh, I actually don't remember. <laughs> I know he goes by the name DHH. It's uh, I don't I don't actually know. Dan David something something. David Danny Miller. Yes, there you go. What company does he work for? Huh? The company they work for. Uh, they make base, uh, no, not base, is it base camp? Project. Base camp. Yeah, base camp. So he was making base camp, and they have these chats that he released now where the initial version of Ruby on Rails was so bad memory writing, it was leaking so much memory that he had a loop that would restart it every 10 minutes. And that's <laughs> what they were doing in production. Yeah. He didn't tell that when he had this awesome page explaining Ruby on Rails and this really cool framework, right? And they eventually fixed all those bugs, but I mean, I, I guess it worked, but you know, it's a pretty big uh, fault. So are all software faults security bugs? What do you think? Was that good answer? That's not necessarily. Not necessarily? What do you mean by that? Uh, well, obviously, all faults are bugs. <coughs> they don't have to always be security related. They can all they, they could possibly um, uh, just compute a value incorrectly. It doesn't have to do explicitly with security. So. Just compute a value incorrectly. That generally could that be a security fault? Then? Or it can be an UI fault. A UI fault in what sense? Like it's one pixel off or something? Yeah, one pixel mm -hmm. like it's not showing yeah, the text or something. Could be errors also, and an error is different from a bug. In what sense? Uh, a bug is something which is not in the specification and it mm -hmm. is performing something weird. An error is something that uh, it, it could be like memory exception. Uh, okay, so maybe it's a problem of terminology. So for me, they're all the same. Errors, faults, bugs, to me, they're exactly the same thing. Right? Whatever we would consider a problem with the software, if it's not doing what it's supposed to be doing, some kind of fault or error or bug. To me, they're all the same thing. So then the question is, is any problem with the, the program either doing unexpected behavior, unintended behavior, or underintended behavior, or is any of those a security bug, or all of them a security bug? No, why not? You just mount no. Every bug can already be security bug. Everybody will think, yes, I have a really good job at like, security would be really important. <coughs> no, I'd say security fault for a subset. Software bugs. Based on how we define security, you've got confidentiality, integrity, and 
availability. So maybe if it falls outside of those, the bug does, then it doesn't. That's not really in the subset. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, so a subset uh, that seems reasonable. Does that make sense? Yeah. Maybe disagree. Uh, I don't think we can prove that not all, the, I mean, bugs are not security bugs because there might be an innovative way that someone will find out in the future that could be used to exploit that bug. So maybe all faults could be security bugs. Yeah, that's definitely one way to look at it, right? That actually happens a lot throughout the history yeah. is, like, we've known about buffer overflow, we'll actually see examples. We've known, like, buffer overflows were a problem in the, I don't know, early 80s. And it wasn't until people started actively exploiting it that they were like, oh, this is actually a serious problem. They're not just programming faults, right? It's actually a security problem. So I think, I don't know, to me, I guess the answer, at a high level is no, right? I think it's pretty clear you can have a bug, like let's say uh, the text is moved one pixel to the left or to the right. It's hard to imagine a scenario where that is a security problem, right? Where that violates the confidentiality, the integrity, and the availability of the system, right? So that's like a pretty simple fault. Um, but then you have the cases, so somebody was talking about, uh, you know, a UI problem where text is missing, right? Um, I guess it depends on what that text is in the context of the system, right? If it's the price of an item, well now I'm, uh, or maybe it's a discount that could be applied to a purchase or something like that, right? That affects what the customer is paying. Yeah, that could be violating the integrity of the system. Um, or, or some of the examples. What are the other examples? You know, you have to think creatively and think how. So, bugs don't just exist in isolation, right? It's all about in what co the context of what system, right? Uh, but I think generally we can say, um, in most cases, uh, not all security faults are security bugs. So then. Um, so if you have a fault, some kind of software fault, software crashes, software is not performing as it should be, it's doing something unexpected, it's not doing something expected. Uh, it could be a security bug or we'll use the term from here on out, vulnerability. So vulnerability exists in the software, right? Or well, exists, we'll say in the system at this point now. Um, And so it's only when that, so is, I don't know, is a vulnerability, let's say you know there's a vulnerability in your system, is it a <coughs> bad thing? Are they all bad? Or are they all equally bad? No. No? Why not? Uh, it could be something very trivial. Uh, say, it prints all A's as B's for some reason. That could be a vulnerability, and it doesn't affect too much on the UI and not the user at least, depending on where it's coming from. All A's is B's. How would that affect the, so is it actually a vulnerability? Does that affect the security of the system? Um, given that we are calling all bugs and faults as vulnerabilities. Oh, no, no, we're not. They may be, right? They may be, but they're not all. So we're kind of taking the subset approach, right? So some faults, I mean, you, know, you have to think very hard, right? But I think that would probably be in a case where it's not necessarily a security. Even then, uh, uh, suppose the, uh, say, the product ID was a little different from what was there on the back end to what was there on the front end. That might affect the user a lot, and uh, but if the price changed to a large extent, then that's going to be a huge problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let's go into the example that was used earlier about, uh, let's say we have a login form, right, that's uh, a login form where we can type in our username and type in our password, but it doesn't actually check the password, it just lets anybody in. <coughs> I mean, where a web page only has a login form but, is, but does nothing with the login information. I mean, gives no extra access to a logged in user. So. Yeah, or maybe, let's say it's on a machine inside of a secure facility that you have to be a military personnel to access, right? It's not even you know, <coughs> network accessible, right? It could be accessed only by certain people and they have a key card to get in too, mm -hmm. to even access it. I mean, it's not great, so it still could allow somebody to get in there, but you can see there's all these steps that they have to take uh, to get there. So, really, so a vulnerability is, I kind of think about it as a, in some ways a fact, right? It exists in the system, but it's just sitting there, not doing anything, right? I mean, it's just part of the system. So it's only when somebody actually tries to exploit that vulnerability or use that unintended functionality 
Um, so that's what we call it when it's triggered or exploited. That's when it actually compromises the security of the system. So kind of the way to think about it is the vulnerability is a problem in the system uh, that could compromise and affect the security. Uh, but how that actually gets exploited may depend. And you need to know knowledge of both things, right? You need to know what is this vulnerability in the system? What could it allow an attack uh, like at a base level? What is this vulnerability? And then how could an attacker actually exploit this? Like I said, if you have to have physical access to the machine, that's a lot worse than actually that example um, Dropbox a few years ago had this problem with their website where you could just type in anybody's email address and any password and they weren't actually checking the password. That's a huge issue, right? That's a major, major issue. Um, you know, incredibly critical, very important, affected the security of their application there, but now you talk about the same problem in a different scenario, it becomes different. Right? And it's about the exploitability. How easy is it to exploit that user? So if you think about some vulnerabilities, like let's say they require the user themselves to type in a very special sequence into a text box and then hit enter and then the program crashes. Right? So it's probably a vulnerability because it affects the availability of the system. Um, how easily exploitable is it? Yeah, it all depends on, so you're the attacker, right? You have to somehow trick the user to type in this special sequence into this box and hit enter. It's not impossible, people do it all the time. Has anybody seen those things on Facebook where it says copy and paste this thing into the yeah. URL bar? <laughs> okay. Actually, if you look, um, I think if you go on Facebook now, they've disabled the developer console and they've disabled pasting JavaScript into URL bars um, because they wanted to stop these kind of behaviors. Uh, because it was working, you know, I don't know, how many users does Facebook have now? Is it a billion, two, I don't know, tons of users on Facebook, right? With all these users, some people are gonna fall for it, right? It happens all the time. Um, but if it's, you know, custom software on the desktop, it's probably maybe hard to convince somebody to do that, but, um, you know, it still could happen. Okay, software security should be easy, right? Just write perfect software. Yes. Yep. Done. Class. <laughs> Go home. Rest this yeah. no. Just kidding. Just kidding. Uh, so is that actually enough? Let's say we live in a world where we can write perfect software. Is this enough? Nope. Nope. Why? Because we... New requirements might come in? Yeah. So let's say we write perfect software once. And then the perfect team that wrote that perfect software leaves, <laughs> and then maintenance programmers come in and have to develop a feature X and extend that, right? Who aren't so perfect. Yeah, that's a good one. What else? Yeah. Users? Users. Ooh, what about users? Are you saying the users aren't perfect? No. <laughs> to think about, right? Even if we make the, so if you think about, uh, everybody remember Windows Vista? Yeah. <laughs> right, the user account control, the UAC, so it would pop up every time a program, hey, this program is trying to run as administrator, do you want to allow it? And it ha you know, it's a good security feature, but it happens so frequently that users just got in the habit of always clicking yes, 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 yes. So then when something really bad did happen, they just clicked yes without thinking about it, right? So you have, you know, I wouldn't, so we call that a perfect security feature, but a very good security feature that didn't take into account that users aren't perfect. Yeah, what else? Yeah. And isn't perfect subjective, you know? For you it might be that, okay, this is my perfect software, but I might still be able to, you know, exploit certain vulnerability or, you know, make it do things it's not supposed to do. Let's well, say it's perfect. It's perfect, perfect, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I say it's perfect, no. It's perfect in the fact that it, it does exactly what it's supposed to do, does nothing more, nothing less, no software faults in the software. What if the requirements are not perfect? The requirements aren't perfect? Yeah, it's a whole other issue. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even the libraries that the software is using might get deprecated in the f future and like it can break down the software. Yeah, right? So, I don't, how many, um, 
do we, does anybody really just write a software, piece of software entirely from scratch? Like you start with C, you use the C standard library and that's it and nothing yeah. else? Yeah. No, right, it'd be right. crazy, right? We use programming languages, we use the libraries of these programming languages, we use third party libraries, we use frameworks. Mm -hmm. Those frameworks use libraries and other third party things, mm -hmm. which those things probably use other things, right? Mm -hmm. All of this is getting into your matrix. So, um, okay, so yeah, so we, okay, we talked about it. We need to have perfect software and we have perfect users. So we train them all. <laughs> so what else? Are we still perfect here? Yeah. Like any backdoors, like on the server? Backdoors on the server, so what do you mean by that? Um, like if it's not programmed properly, like there can be one piece of software which is perfect, but not all software can be perfect. Yeah, so let's say all of our software is perfect. All software is perfect. Yeah. The hardware could also be backdoored. Yeah, the hardware could be backdoored. What about, so let's say I write this beautiful piece of software and I give it to everyone in this room and you go and run it, it's perfect. And then you go and run it. Are all of your installations gonna be perfect? Why? <laughs> what was that? Yeah, the requirements, what was that? Somebody else said. Operating system, the environment, yeah. The configuration, right? So now we have to make sure not only do we write the software properly, but that's configured in exactly the right way. This is a big problem in PHP, because PHP had special uh, configuration parameters to enable uh, magic quotes, so it would automatically quote input that came in. Well, if you install that same application that's secure on one server, and you take it to a server with a different version of PHP that doesn't have this, it's now insecure. So yeah, you have to make sure that the software's perfect. Um, and so somebody mentioned this. We have to make sure we, that we're using a perfect operating system. Right? Because our application trusts that the operating system is doing things correctly. It trusts that the operating system is keeping the integrity and confidentiality. So, you know, why would I, if you write this beautiful, perfect application, great, I'll just find a vulnerability in Linux and exploit it, and now I've got your application and all your data. Right? Even though you wrote a perfect application, and you have perfect users, and you've configured it perfectly. So is that enough? Is that all we need? All we need, Boko? We talked about hardware, what are some other things? What, what else could go wrong? This is what we're trying to do is think, get this adversarial mindset, yeah. So uh, our software will depend, I mean, it will, any software will uh, get converted to uh, machine level, uh, machine level bits and bytes, mm -hmm. and afterwards it has to be processed through the processors, and that depends on the transistors, and that depends on the behavior of electrons, and many of which may depend on their temperature, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. In, that, in that sequence, anything can go wrong. Yeah, there's literally, uh, I think I saw a hand over here, yeah. Um, perfect privacy. Perfect privacy? You can find out that you're using perfect software. Yeah, so we're not, I, actually, in this class, I'm kind of going to put the privacy art, uh, aspects on the side, because it is a whole separate thing about, um, you know, what if, maybe I've done it perfectly, but maybe I'm giving up my privacy to do so, or something like that, right? Like, it is definitely a component, but that's a whole, whole other issue. Um, yeah, so talking about transistors, um, there's actually this story. So when I took a grad class in uh, computer architecture, our professor told us the story that there was these two supercomputers that I think the military created, and they were done exactly identical, and they had one that was, I'm gonna make up a place because it fits. Let's say they had one in like San Diego, and they had one in Denver. And the one in Denver had twice the error rate as the one in San Diego. <coughs> so they go through, they look at all the parts, they repair them, replacing them, it's all fine. So what they realize, what's the big difference between, well, I don't know. What's the difference between San Diego and Denver? The temperature. Elevation, yeah, exactly, right? So uh, Denver's the Mile High City, right? So it's at a much higher elevation. And so when you're at a much higher elevation, you have more cosmic rays hitting your uh, system. And so they found out that's what it was. It was the higher incidence of cosmic rays at that elevation caused random bit flips to happen in the system, which would eventually cause the system to crash. <laughs> Crazy, right? So they put lead shielding on it, and like all the problems went away. Like nuts to think about. Yeah. 
So what about your hypervisor? Maybe you're running hypervisors, VirtualBox, VMware. Mm -hmm. You're running something in the cloud, you're running on top of a hypervisor, KVM. Mm -hmm. um, what about, so we talked about hardware. What's controlling the hardware? What was it? Well, uh, Firmware. What, is that what you said? No, I did uh, Oh, power, <laughs> yes, power too. Uh, <laughs> there's code that runs the hardware, right? Each, almost every piece of hardware in your system has some firmware that's running it. There's actually been people that have shown that, so there's um, code that controls your network card, and so they found a buffer, I don't know if it's exactly a buffer overflow, but they found a vulnerability in the firmware on that network card, so they could send you one packet and exploit your network card, and from there your network card has direct memory access to the entire physical memory of the machine. So then they can completely control and own your hypervisor, your operating system, and all of your applications. Just from one packet that never gets sent up to your operating system because it gets stopped at the network card. So yeah, you, yeah, it's super easy. You just write perfect software, you have perfect users. Not only do you have to write your own perfect software, you have to somehow ensure or rewrite everybody else's software that you depend on. You have to configure that software perfectly, you have to have a perfect operating system, use a perfect hypervisor, run on a system with perfect firmware, and run on a system with perfect hardware. Right? So they've, um, there's actually been research done that's shown that you can actually um, build a CPU such that with a certain number of instructions, the CPU drops down into ring zero, so it has complete access. Uh, like operating system level access. This is something that you can actually build into the chip itself to be able to control the system. So this is why I still have a job, right? So this <laughs> is not easy once you start listing it out and thinking about all the things you actually have to do. So, kind of what I said on Monday is we need to, we're gonna learn how to develop secure software or some strategies, techniques to develop secure software. Um, but we also need to learn software insecurity. So we, I don't want us to be talking about these things at a high theoretical level about these type of vulnerabilities. I want us to really understand the technical details of how these vulnerabilities exist. Uh, so we're gonna answer some of the questions like how does software break, right? What are the types of ways that software can break and cause security problems? And to do this, one of the main, my main goal in this class uh, besides uh, not making it work a lot, but having a lot of fun doing a lot of cool, interesting projects, let's phrase it that way. Um, I want you to develop an adversarial mindset. Right? So that's the key thing about security, is you need to be able to look at a system and say, okay, what are the goals of the system? What are the intentions of this system? What does the system actually allow me to do? And then what's the difference there? How can I force the system to do something and not only that, what does it actually mean for the application, right? Is it actually a security vulnerability? Um, so this is the key thing that we're going to develop. So this is why we're looking at all of these software problems. We're going to talk about bugs to develop this mindset. Because without this, how can you know how to defend a system and develop software securely if you don't know all the ways it could go wrong and you can't? So I can teach you about all the different vulnerability classes, all that kind of stuff, right? But what I really want is for you to have the mindset so you can go find entirely new classes of vulnerabilities. So you can look at the new, the crazy Internet of Things, protocols, technologies, Bitcoin, and you can look at that and say, huh, what happens if I do this? Or do they think about this? Or what if I send the exact same transaction twice to somebody? How does that change or affect their model? Where does this data go? When I throw data at this system, where does it go? Who touches it? Is, does it get tweeted out to Twitter? Is it input from Twitter? Uh, does it get sent to a third party? Is it part of an XML file? All these kinds of things. Uh, who processes this data? So let's say I give data to a system, maybe I find out it's not vulnerable there, but then later every week an email gets sent out to all the users containing some of that data. Maybe I can influence that email. What can I do with that? These are the kinds of things I want you to think about. And really, the other thing is, what assumptions is this system making? Because this is really what it's about, is you want to try to violate these assumptions. Um, and this is why I really like, like security, because to be able to do this effectively, um, I'm going to make every scene the matrix, or heard of it, maybe? Yep. Yeah, you need to be Neo. You need to see <laughs> the system 
and be able to see all the pieces, how it's all fit together, and be like, aha, if I do this, everything breaks. Right? Mm -hmm. That's what you need to be able to do. <laughs> and that's why this class is very demanding work-wise, is because you need to know everything. All of the, we're breaking down all the abstraction layers here. We're not going to talk about, oh, here's just C and here's a buffer overflow. It's here's a C program, here's exactly how GCC version compiles to x86 assembly, here's how it uses the stack in that assembly, and here's how it does function frames and function calls. And look, with the buffer overflow, we can control this uh, return instruction pointer to be able to execute code of our choosing, right? That's being able to look through and see the matrix and be able to see everything and manipulate it to your, to your will. Uh, so that's what we're going to practice uh, kind of hands-on breaking of software to be able to practice software insecurity. Right. Any questions there? So yeah, this adversarial mindset is very similar to the testing mindset, right? So this is something uh, at Microsoft I really liked. We had um, SDETs, which were software developer engineers and test, I think. Um, which they're getting kind of rid of a little bit, but I thought those guys were amazing. Uh, some of the people on my team were great. So like, I developed this feature, I thought it was all cool, and it was like my very, one, I think I was at an intern at the time, and they came back and they were like, uh, actually when you have dual monitor and it's on the second monitor, not the first monitor, is when uh, a problem occurs and like it crashes. I was like, what? <laughs> I never think to test that, right? Um, but I should have. Um, and so it's part of that, it's doing, weird things, looking at corner cases, trying to think through how did this, how was this software developed, what probably didn't they think about, that kind of stuff. So as part of that, what we're going to do now, so we're going to look at, so trying to develop this adversarial mindset, I find it very helpful to understand and look at the history of, I call it software insecurity or <laughs> hacking or big incidents, that kind of stuff. Um, because I think it really does help frame the context, right? So we can understand our current situation, right? So we can understand why you're here at a class about computer security and why we think it's important. Is that okay? No? Okay. Yeah? Quick question. Sure. Using this previous concept, so I can say that security tests is a set of software. Yeah, so that's, in a sense, yes. So, um, and it's a, the difference to me between software engineering and software security or uh, computer security, it's, I don't, I don't really care about finding bugs, right? You can find bugs all over the place, right? I want to find bugs that allow me to compromise the security of the application. So to do that, you need to understand the application itself, right? To a, to a software engineer or to a software tester, any bug is great, right? If, crash the program, you can do whatever thing, if it's one pixel off, that's a bug. For me, I don't care about that until it affects the security, but you have to have that mindset that says, hmm, I know, okay, now I know I have this functionality, and maybe that thing itself doesn't allow you to do anything, but once you find another flaw, you can put them together and say, aha, I can leak memory, I can leak one memory address, and that allows me to do the buffer overflow, which allows me to do this other thing, and actually exploit it to defeat ASLR and all this other stuff, and now I've completely owned the program. Um, so yeah, to me that's the big difference. They're very, very similar and they use similar techniques. Uh, but the big thing about um, security is you, you need to understand that application, or you need to understand the application and the system in its context. Because ultimately, you know, you need to be able to convince somebody else that it's worth fixing, that it is a real problem. So if you can't say, yeah, you have this one pixel off, but see, that's really important because it affects your confidentiality, whatever, whatever. I mean, that would be hard to sell, but um, you, know, you need to be able to put that in context. Yeah. All right. So to me, the history of security incidents, hacking, is actually tied really closely to the development of the internet. Um, does anybody know in the internet first, like the first beginnings of the internet started? What about that? The DARPA, what about time, like he, around a like decade? In the, in the 70s, in the 70s, in the 70s, yeah, a long time. So, okay. everybody's, I hope, pretty familiar with 
the internet has taken maybe a networking course. That would be very good. Uh, so the internet is a network of networks, right? And they're, each network is autonomous, right? Which actually is really important because it means that um, there's an open architecture and every network is different and has different administrative domains with different goals, right? So the ASU network operates a lot different from the UC Santa Barbara network, which operates a lot different from the Microsoft network, from the Google network, right? All these kinds of things. And it's built in that they can actually do this and have their own uh, thing. And so I, I think it's kind of an understatement, right? The internet is critical to our lives. <laughs> Has anybody not used the internet today so far? <laughs> anybody? I mean, maybe if you just got up at like 10, 5, 10, 25 and rolled over here, maybe you could say that, but yeah, it'd be hard. But you'd have to have not have checked your phone for any emails or text messages or anything like that and look at the weather, what the weather was like today, all that kind of stuff, right? So pretty much everything. Okay, so back in the 70s, DARPA created a project called the ARPANET. And so the first four nodes, I guess it's 1969, huh? Yeah, I'm the uh, So the first four nodes, does anybody know what they are? University With universities Utah. or institutes? Yes. What was that? The University of Utah. University of Utah? There was one in Dallas or? Nope. nope. Michigan, Dallas, no. Nope. UC MIT. What was that? UCSD. What was that? The University of California, Los Angeles. UCLA, yep. Berkeley? Berkeley, nope. MIT, no. <laughs> nope. Are we guessing colleges? Yeah, you're trying to guess colleges. No. Uh, so, part of why I like to say this, my alma mater, UC Santa Barbara, was one of the first nodes. Uh, the Stanford Research Institute and the University of Utah. So, actually, a little funny backstory about this is um, these schools were kind of selected for a little bit political, not, not political as like national politics, but I heard they included Utah because they didn't want to just fund the three uh, California institutions, so then the other states would complain that you're only funding projects in California, so that's kind of why Utah was, uh, was included. Uh, I got to think that SRI was probably included, so it wasn't just like a university thing, they had some like private institutions involved. Um, but yeah, so this was the map. This was the internet. So you have UCLA, UC, SB, SRI, and Utah. And then you can see the different uh, machines here. So this is in those boxes. It has the machines. So the 360 at UC Santa Barbara, the System 7, the 940, uh, so the PDP, 10. PDP 10. And I, I'll be honest, I don't know what all of these things are. A little past that. So the crazy thing about this thing that we use every single day that's connecting our fridges to news feeds and our TVs to, I guess, ads and stuff, started with just these four, these four nodes. Um, and it was based, so the other thing I really like, little tidbit, is it didn't start with TCP, it started with another protocol called the Network Control Protocol. Uh, so in the 80s, as more nodes went on, um, January 1st, 1983, they just moved. They moved the whole entire network to a completely new protocol, uh, TCP IP. I think they call it the flag day. Hmm. So you know how they did this? How they do this? So think about it here today, how, how would you do this? Just turn it off and turn it back on? <laughs> <laughs> Difficult. Who's going to do that? It's a system of autonomous networks. It's kind of a trick question, because I don't yeah. think you could do it today. I honestly think it would be virtually impossible to do something like this today. Mm -hmm. This is what they did. Is, um, actually, it's great. So one of the professors uh, who's retired at Santa Barbara, he's been there since the mid-60s. Um, and he was involved in my lab. And so in his office, there's a book. It's about this thick, about this thick. And it says, um, I think it says internet directory on the side, or ARPANET directory, or something like that. And I was like. Dick, what's in this? What's in this book? He's like, oh, that—that's just a list of every computer on the internet in 1980 something, <laughs> and the name of the administrator, their phone number, and their email address. <laughs> what? <laughs> so yeah, the network was so small they just 
decide, they decided. They called people and they all decided on a date and they decided they were going to switch over from NCP to TCP. <laughs> and they just did it. Yeah, they turned it off and turned it all back on with new protocols and yeah, it just worked. I guess this is crazy. Think about it. You can't do that now, right? Every, every network advantage you want, like IPv6, has to be yeah. backwards compatible with what we currently yeah. have. We right, cannot completely move from IPv4 to v6. Ah, it's, I guess. It'd be just yeah. crazy. There'd be no yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Think about like economies would crash, like companies would crumble. Like it would be it would be pandemonium. It would be nuts. Uh, about the same time in the eighties, DARPA funds uh, development of Berkeley Unix. And the important thing here is that um, its TCP IP implementation uh, introduced the socket programming abstraction, which is used in almost every network application now. Um, so then, so I don't know if they did it concurrently, but ARPANET in the 80s, um, the internet grew beyond just ARPANET and just the universities. And MILNET is the military network, so the military's version. And back in the day, they were connected. And then the military realized, oh, it's a terrible idea to let <laughs> random people have access to our military network. So they completely disconnected. Um, I don't. I don't know if they still are. That's a good question. I should look that up. <laughs> Maybe they know off the top of their heads that any military people are here. <laughs> Is the mill net still completely separate? I would assume it would be because no. Well, yeah. The top secret stuff would be, but and they Probably. have different subnets that are just completely off. But you can email now people that are on mill net. Yeah. That, that's within the last ten years. Huh. Interesting. Crazy. Um, and then I like this that the NSF created a supercomputer network. And when you have supercomputers, you need to transfer data incredibly fast from one location to the other. So they built this awesome network on this backbone of 56 kilobit per second, <laughs> which is just nothing to think about. But you got to think about the time, right? It was back in 1986. Yeah. Like that's, you know, that's fast back then, right? I mean, that's all you're doing. So the 90s and the early 2000s, this is when everything started to explode, internet-wise. Uh, incredibly fast growth in both size and volume. So what was the killer application of the internet? Netscape. What was that? Netscape problem. Netscape? Yeah, I'd say more generally the World Wide Web. So the web really was yeah. the key driving factor of the internet. Pretty much up until that point, only nerds were on the internet, to be perfectly frank, right? So they had email, they had mailing lists, or not mailing lists, they had like Usenet and a bunch of other services, FTP, um, but there was no, you know, they were clunky, and it wasn't until uh, in 1991, Tim Berners-Lee at CERN uh, creates the World Wide Web. He used it to, uh, his idea is he wanted to, uh, he worked at CERN, so what does CERN build? Yeah, the large hadron collider. Yeah. I don't know if that's a like, hadron. Yeah. It's made up that word. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, that big collider thing, which is huge, right? So this is, he worked on this, you know, uh, to help this pro this project, and they have a lot of people, a lot of different resources, everybody moving every place, and he was like, huh, it would be really useful to have some place people could go to like get a list of who's in what offices and what their phone numbers were, and then like it'd be great to like be able to like. Because the idea of hypertext was around, so he's like, it'd be great to like click on somebody's name, to then go to their web page, so you can find out more about like their, to get more information about them. And then he built this simple uh, con uh, implementation on the Next Step operating system, and released it, and then it spread like crazy. And I'll say the internet explodes. Um, it's really hard to get a feel for how big the internet has become, how big the web has become, and how much it's really changed. Um, so here is a graph of, this is the number of websites in existence from, actually 1999, which I guess if you extended it to 1991, it would be one, right? <laughs> All the way up to now. Um, I'll be honest, I don't know their exact methodology for determining this, but you can see, it's got, let's see, I'm gonna go to Let's see, I, mean, I thought the internet was big in like, I don't know, let's say 2006. Not even like 120 million websites in 2006. And now, 2015, we're at like, I don't know, around, we're hovering around a billion websites. And this is probably only public ones, right? It's probably not counting all the internal stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how do you count something like Facebook? Yeah, it's one website that has a billion users, right? So 
yeah, this, this growth is just absolutely insane. And what's funny is I was looking at, um, so my advisor had a picture from 2006, so this is just 99 to 2006, and you see the same exponential growth through there. We can't even see it here because of the growth is so big. So, we live in a pretty cool time. Uh, this is a really cool visualization I like of the internet. So this is a visualization of networks and how they're connected to each other uh, based on real data. Um, so yeah, it's cool. And you can see some of the backbones there in white that are transmitting high volumes of data. Yeah, probably not over 56K. Yeah. So would you say also that the, uh, the arrival of Linux in the 1990s helped? No, uh, actually not. So, well, I, I don't know, actually. Um, the interesting thing is that Tim Berners-Lee created his implementation on the next step operating system, which was the computer, when Steve Jobs left Apple, he founded the company Next, hmm. and they made actually a really cool operating system, uh, which is actually pretty fun to program in and all this stuff, and so he developed the client and the server application on Next, for Next Step. Um, it didn't, I think that internet didn't, uh, the web didn't really take off until people ported it to other languages and that kind of stuff, but I, I don't know necessarily that it was specifically Linux or I think in the 90s it wasn't huge, yeah. I think. Uh, it's more, it was more uh, Berkeley. You'd see a lot of Berkeley and a lot of Sun. Okay, yeah. Or, that makes sense. Uh, I was at MCI WorldCom in 98. Mm. And then uh, I worked for an internet company like that did dial up in 95. I did all support. Cool. And, but it was, all, it was all Unix. It was all Berkeley. Right, so some variant of Unix and C, right? I mean, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. I was using, I mean, your web pages. Interactive stuff was all done through CGI through uh, right. Mm -hmm. C. Right, right. Cool. All right, so this is going to be a brief overview of some of the incidents we're going to talk about. There's a lot of incidents, but I try to pick some that really try and kind of stretch your concept of what hacking is, where it came from. Uh, so in 1972, we had phone ringing uh, in. Also, in the end of 1972, uh, Bob Metcalf. Published an RFC. So, what's an RFC? Request, Request for comments. Yeah, so it's with, I don't know specifically the Internet Engineering Task Force, but uh, basically he issued this document that we'll look at about um, what he saw as the state of security then in 1972. Uh, in 86, German hackers tried to obtain secrets to sell to the KGB, uh, which is a crazy interesting story. Uh, in 1988 was the first Internet worm which is also really interesting. Um, in 94, Kevin Mitnick, has people heard of Kevin Mitnick's name now? Some of us. <laughs> All right, famous hacker who uh, attacked, broke into the uh, San Diego Supercomputing Center. Yep. And more recently, in 2010, I really like this one, Paul. Uh, Albert Gonzalez uh, received a 20 year sentence for hacking. So he and his hacking group stole, I think it was 200 million credit cards um, and they were caught and they got 20 years in federal prison. Um, and there's, I have the dots here because there's so many more. We can talk about hard bleed, we can talk about all kinds of stuff, yeah. Uh, why isn't uh, Alec Turing's computer to break codes of Germans? Ooh, um, <laughs> the Enigma machine? Yeah, the bot machine. Uh, I don't, kind of a, a, I don't know much about it. I think that would be good for a crypto class because I think that's more relevant there. Uh, for me, these are what shapes our current thinking about software security, right? So I don't think that did necessarily as much like Enigma, um, but I think these things definitely did, especially like the internet worm and the German hacking incident. Like these were things that the, the security community was just started was talking about and worried about and thinking about how do we solve those problems. Okay, so it all starts with Captain Crunch. So, what is Cap'n Crunch for those that maybe not from this country and don't know? Eric? It's a cereal, and at some point they used to have a toy. Yeah, it's a cereal, so it's just a box of cereal. And Cap'n Crunch is the mascot. Um, so, in 1972, the guy, uh, his name is John Draper, he found that the whistle that comes in a box of Cap'n Crunch 
produce the sound at the 2600 hertz frequency. This is what it looks like. So if you want to go to the store and buy a box of Captain Crunch so you can feel part of the hacker spirit uh, <laughs> with John Draper, uh, you're totally welcome. This is the whistle that uh, produced that sound. So why, why does this matter? Why, I don't know, what, who cares? I, I don't know. It's a phone dial. What was that? It's a phone dial tone. A phone dial tone. Yeah, so it turns out that the 2600 frequency was used by AT&T to authorize long distance calls. <laughs> so what would happen is, and I, I'll be honest, I'm not an expert on telephony systems, especially circuit switch and all this stuff and exactly how they work. But the basic idea was when your phone call would go over the network and when you would make a, um, when it would authorize you to make a long distance call, it would have to communicate that fact from your operator to the other operator to the switches in between, right? And it used frequencies over the phone. So it used, it would make a sound at 2600 to say, yes, this person's good to go. So what John Draper found out is what we now call phone freaking. So he, um, alias, his hacker name became Captain Crunch, and he built this blue box. Um, oh, are we out of time? Mm -hmm. oh. All right, so we'll continue the story of Captain. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> 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 <laughs>